darkness, a peaceful and tranquil setting. Within it, the sounds of nature are at its purest, brilliant and uncontrolled, sounds of life that are at the moment for the moment. As the dark starlit sky begins to alter to colors of warmth, the sounds of night fade into the distance as if to chase the night sky. Over the horizon, fresh sounds of life fade in and the setting is new with a brilliant yellow sun. Our lives are filled with many images and sounds, some moving and blurred, still and sharp, bright and dark. Our senses deceive us on how complex these sounds and images are. They distract our attention from simple moments. If we take a single moment and look deeper than what's present on the surface, there is always a new discovery to be made. Maybe an invisible breeze that makes the leaves shimmer. The rhythmic ripple of water. The sun's light shining through gaps between leaves. The song of morning birds. The transition of colors of the evening sky. The drowsy impact rain has on us. This is nature in its purest form. With the hustle and bustle of our daily lives, we tend to forget the gentle and brilliant natural landscape. Multitasking, answering phones, discussing complicated plans, sitting in traffic jams. Where is a better place? What is a better scene? How do we escape the complicated present, the now, the stress? Maybe the answer is nature, but what is nature? Is it the bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic? One look at a parking lot in Yellowstone and you might think you're at a theme park. Or is nature the place so far removed from our lives that we've forgotten its wonders? Nature is the place, the serene landscape that has had absolutely no human influence in its development, virgin in its existence. The question is, is there such a place on Earth? The first place we look to are national and state parks, but haven't they been influenced by humans? If these aren't the answers, why? Where do we look? On the dwindling frontier of forests, plains, and waterways lies a neighbor of 6.5 billion people. Every second, this population increases by 4.3. What are the limits? Where are these people going to live? How will the earth sustain that number of people? Who will suffer and who will benefit? Most importantly, what will happen to the natural environment by 2042? The answers are not simple by any means, but humanity is adaptable and better solutions are possible for both nature and society. Then what's the problem?
Perfection is possibly a desire of every citizen on earth. Is there actual perfection in the solutions we decide on in our daily lives or as a global citizen? Perhaps. Perhaps not. No matter what we decide, there will always be drawbacks on society and the environment. The idea is to progress for future's sake. Progress is responsible for where we are today. If it weren't for the wonders of technology, you wouldn't be seeing images or hearing sounds of nature as you sit in front of the screen. We desire progress and enjoy what it provides. But what if we sacrifice to continue to acquire cool gadgets or have the benefit of faster internet browsing? Each time we make progress, we must adjust to it. But what happens to those objects we had to replace for advancement? Do you remember the first listening device you had? Maybe it was a record player or a tape player. For younger people, maybe it was an iPod. Whatever you started with, I'm sure you advanced with technology by purchasing better and smaller devices. Did you throw away the old ones because it crowded your drawers? No matter who we are, we collect artifacts because it makes us feel good or that we marvel at the technology. It's part of our being. For every object we throw away, we take away a part of nature. It's not only the objects we personally own that are changing nature, but it's the technology we use that invades nature. While watching this program, you're using technology. What is supplying the energy? Each frame you see, you're buying fossil fuel from nature. Within a 48-hour period, more than 30 cars of coal travel through a city to supply the demand of electricity. That shipment was chiseled out of the earth. When a coal mine is exhausted, it's gone, and more land is acquired to supply the demand. Removing trees and vegetation, relocating topsoil. Modifying the earth, in most cases, for personal reasons. Are we the number one invasive species? Every acre we expand beyond the current limits, we change the world we know forever. It's a small point of no return in the grand scheme. What other human-made changes is there that set the point of no return? Population is rapidly increasing. The question is, how will we feed the future inhabitants of Earth? Urban centers increase in size each year, taking agricultural land that feeds the people of the city. Each field that is consumed to house a portion of the population removes the source of food for those residents. To compound problems, the expansion of cities creates a looming disaster. Floods. If rain falls for extended periods of time and at high rates, Flooding occurs due to compaction of soil from expansion and the removal of vegetation that would otherwise reduce the rate. When the rains stop, how will we deal with the lack of water? Dividing the water for both consumers and producers is a continuing debate where water resources are diminishing. Who decides where the hot commodity goes? Farmers, called producers, need water to support the population's food demand. But how do you ration out water to an increasing urban population and continue to have ample amount for crop production? In the West, the Colorado River has been divided by a series of dams to provide water supplies to different cities. With diminishing rains and the population on the increased in those cities, the Colorado River barely makes it to its original end at the Pacific Ocean. But the supply of water to cities is not the only problem. Human changes to the river system are causing ecological degradation. Colder waters we lease to manage flooding are causing the extinction of natural species. 
What are the solutions to reverse the damage? How can we balance our need with the need of nature? If you've thought by now that this is a depressing situation, you're right. But the questions are presented as a warning. In the past, the warning has come in the form of a disaster. The Black Plague. 9-11. The Dust Bowl, Katrina, and Titanic. Do we have a false sense of security? Each disaster that we witness immediately changes the way we regard our natural environment. If a natural disaster doesn't occur for an extended period of time, do we become complacent? The Titanic disaster is an example of how we regard ourselves with nature. Superior. Prior to the demise of Titanic, the ship was labeled unsinkable. During that period in history, the Edwardian era, humans believed that nature could be controlled to benefit society. Today, some believe that by dropping a bomb into a hurricane to blow it apart before it does harm to cities is a viable answer. But think about it. Heat is the primary ingredient for hurricane formation. Is it possible to control nature for our benefit? Do we continue to work to find ways to prevent disaster through technology? Or do we come to grips with nature and find possible solutions that allow a better coexistence? Expedition Nature's Realm is the exploration of questions and answers to determine our place with nature. It's the expedition of the individual's place in a fragile world. Will we continue to change our ways just when disasters occur, only to become complacent in time? Is this determined by generations? Do we act this way just because we didn't witness a disaster? How do we continue to regard the warnings left by those before us? Will we move in inches or move in miles to change the current routine? Will we find ways to diminish the warnings from nature? Are we going to continue down this path, only to utter those fatal words, it was too late? Maybe you're asking, how significant would my contribution be to a global problem? Although we are minuscule creatures in a vast world, we have contributed greatly to harming the environment. One person can't change the world, but it's the attitude that changes the way we think about our existence with nature. No matter how much we actually know it, we are extremely influential in the daily lives of friends and family. Our attitude toward the environment leaves an imprint on the attitude of others. In the past, communication was difficult and slow. Word of events took time to reach other parts of the world, Today, technology has allowed globalization, where news and discoveries are almost instantaneous. Every day, there are environmental disasters occurring throughout our planet. Some small and others large. The evidence is there in the content of many forms of communication. If an environmental situation arises in distant lands, do we take notice? Or do we say, that won't happen here? But is it not true that that is possible? To say that particular situations are not possible is more of a problem than we might think. If one believes that it's not possible, then ten others think the same way. Is this what our predecessors were trying to tell us? The signs of warning are around us. We see pictures. Read and watch the news. Hear through word of mouth the harm we have on the environment. If a balance between humanity and nature is not determined soon, what will the future state of the environment be? Equally important, what will the state of humanity be? Most of us have been to a natural setting, whether it was a park or preserve, but why do we go to these places? What do you hope to gain from a trip to nature? Some go for the splendor of nature to watch animals. Some go to witness the natural beauty of the colors and sounds,
Others go to reflect on their personal lives, to be at ease and reduce stress. If we lose what we have in nature, what will be the result? Are we ready to accept the repercussions of our actions? Why do we wait? Persuasive, maybe. Negative, definitely. But these questions inspired by people and students alike are the foundation of the problems that need to be answered by the residents of our planet. If we continue to ignore the warnings, we're hurting our future generations and ourselves. Decide for yourself what needs to be done, but also decide for the little one who will, one day, make decisions for many. After all, the wonderful discoveries that he or she makes while hiking along a path in the woods will be important for future inhabitants of our planet. Why destroy what discoveries they find?